Sackler Shed today. Um, we're going to go to the Headwaters area and learn a little bit today. And, uh, and then I'm going to skip a whole bunch and just do a little ending. Um, and that's the teaser part. <laughs> there is some information along the way. And um, if you don't think you can go to the class or if you're interested in going to the class but you want to know more, I made a little fact sheet in the back. And it's just simply links to other websites. So, um, and it's not links to everything that I might talk about or introduce. But um, there's a few links um, back there if you want to be you know, an investigator yourself and go in and begin um, finding out answers to questions that you might have. So uh, area original is fees. And then number two there, which sort of follows along with that definition. Um, I have a really big map here. I don't know if you all can see it because we couldn't get an easel. But um, this is a topographical map, which means that it shows elevation as well as places. Um, and uh, this entire topographic area right here uh, on this map is the upper part of our watershed. And I've got some other maps with me if anybody's later interested. Uh, the reason I wanted to add a map is because it feeds right into what Dan is going to be talking about, maps and mapping. Um, so with that said, I do have a little mini San Miguel River watershed map here. It is not complete. Um, you can see we start down up you know, here in Telluride. It looks down, but obviously we're up in elevation. The river flows all the way down, goes out through Nucla. Um, it kind of spurts off the end there. And it doesn't show exactly where the San, Miguel, the San Miguel River technically ends, which is when it confluences with the Little Dolores River, then becoming the Dolores River. Um, quick question, being a teacher. Who can have an educated guess as to why, when it confluences, it becomes the Dolores? Oh, come on. Dolores is the bigger watershed. Thank you. That's it. Yes. Um, so this is our watershed. You can see the towns that it runs through. Um, and this does include most of the towns. There's one town that's not a town anymore that's not on here. And um, we will actually talk about that just a little bit. And the links, part of the information page, the links to all of these towns in our watershed are on that page, just because each of those websites for each of those towns has a lot of information, um, historic and so forth. So those links are pretty cool. So we're going to start at the top of our watershed. Uh, most of these photos, I try to use most of my own photos um, just to make it a little more personal so that we're almost walking along the watershed. Um, but um, we're going to start in one of the drainages. And I simply wanted to start with this photograph because Telluride is in the picture. Um, anybody that's been up Bear Creek? recognizes this view. This is one of our drainages um, that goes into the San Miguel River. And it's Bear Creek. The town of Telluride has a preserve down at the end here of Bear Creek. Um, these drainages, side, anybody know what these side? Jenny Russell? Tributaries. Tributaries, thank you. Just to throw a few good words out there. You should have seen that word earlier. Good. Um, so this is one of the tributaries, and um, considered part of the headwaters of uh, the San Miguel River. And uh, this is Bear Creek itself. Flows at you know different different levels at different times of the year. Obviously, a big rushing torrent as we get towards uh, May and June, with the uh, spring runoff. Anybody been at everybody been at Bear Creek? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. If you haven't, go. <laughs> um, and uh, just um, some of the, um, you know, wildflowers, a, different, a little bit of a different season here, you know, heading into summer. That's um, San Joaquin Ridge back there behind us, um, you know, coming out of Bear Creek. This is the hillside. Just to put this into perspective, I wanted this slide because this is just off. Um, you've just exited um, Revelation Bowl area just to bring it back to where we are right now with our season and anybody that might have actually been up in Revelation Bowl today. Um, 
we're kind of staying up at this end of our watershed, um, Blue Lake. It's uh, generally considered um, the San Miguel headwaters. There's a few people that might you know, ha take issue with that, but um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Blue Lake is above the Bridal Veil vale Falls. You all kind of to put you out at the east end of our canyon, and you continue back to the east. And um, like I said, generally considered the headwaters. It is an extremely deep lake, 330 feet deep, uh, very deep for a high mountain lake. It's surrounded by a 13,000 foot cirque of mountains. Yes, sir? Was it man-made deep? No. No? No. Right, right? Okay. <laughs> I keep looking at my reference point back there, Alessandra Jacobson, she works with me with the water certification program. No, well, we, we could get into that, no, but they did go down in there and dig and um, a little side and, and they did create a, a conduit for the water to come out, yeah. but they didn't make the lake but deeper. It's naturally deep, yeah. It's but I've read about the part about them driving the canal through. Yes. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. And interestingly enough, there is a sunken boat in that lake um, <laughs> that you can, sometimes when it's really clear, I've been told you can see it. I've never seen it, although I've been on the lake. Um, and you know, a lot of these pictures are gonna have students in them because as I was beginning to put this slideshow together, I realized that it seems like all the time that I'm out there, I've got kids and they're always in the picture. So these are some of our Bridal Veil Living Classroom <laughs> students. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, this lake is at about 12,300 feet. Um, just so you know, a little bit of information on that as well. Um, this is Bridal Veil vale Basin, um, and this is considered an alpine zone, and that is uh, the name of a life zone. Our San Miguel River is about 80, 80 miles long. It encompasses about a million acres. Uh, about 60% of it is BLM and Forest Service, um, that, that uh, the entire watershed. And um, we go through, in just that 80 miles, we s technically start with our watershed at about 14,000 feet, and we go all the way down to about 5,000. So in a very short amount of time, our river drops drastically. We go through anywhere, depending on who you're talking to, which expert, four to five life zones in that time, and uh, this is the highest zone. It's the alpine zone. Um, anybody notice something that's not there that generally you might see a lot in the mountains? Students. Students, there's no kids. I got rid of the kids for this one particular picture, told them to all move. Thank you, trees. Um, so this is generally a life zone considered above tree line. Um, and, um, so, and, and at times I've seen this whole hillside covered in columbite, but uh, right now. We uh, live in a glacial valley, a U-shape glacial valley. Um, if you've ever had a chance to look back at our valley, like from the Judd Weeby or one of those um, trails. And um, up at the top of our valley, um, this is something that is, um, it's not necessarily a recent discovery, but these rock glaciers are beginning to be studied, and we have one. Um, they're located in other parts of the state. Uh, this one was just recently exposed up in uh, Bridal Vale Basin. And as I go along and give you information, um, I know a little bit about the entire watershed. And this is the other reason why you really need to take the watershed tour. Um, you know, at least participate in that part of the class. Generally, when I do this tour, I'm the facilitator bringing in experts to talk about all of these different things. One of the experts I might bring in would be potentially Eric Jacobson to talk about you know, this whole end of the valley, um, the history, the mining, the hydrology. Um, I'd bring in 
um, experts from Idorado and from the state of Colorado to talk about that area. I bring in experts from the town of Telluride, San Miguel County. We have some wonderful partners that we work with and all the way down the watershed I'd bring in Susan Grice from the library out in Na Natarita and um, I'd bring in the Historical Society in Natarita. So um, I'm just giving you a little bit, little bit of information, some things to maybe think about. Again, there is also the sheet back there that you can, if you want more information, you can um, look on those websites. But these rock glaciers are pretty darn cool. I took this photo, so this is not just like some stock photo of a rock glacier somewhere. This is in Bridalvale Basin, and you can see the ice um, protruding. So um, this is at our headwaters. And a rock glacier is simply, um, from what I understand, it, it's exactly what it sounds like. It, it's still glacial way down below. And over thousands and thousands of years, the sediment and the rocks have come down and settled over the glacial ice. And with some certain event, whether it be climate change or a combination of events of climate change and human impact and so forth, um, at times they can be exposed. So um, it's a pretty cool phenomena. Um, it was really great to see this this last summer. Um, this is, again, up in that area. These are those darn students got in there again. Um, Bridal Vale Basin, below Lewis Mill, you can see some of the evidence of our history of mining at the, this end of our watershed. And um, it's very interesting because our watershed is sort of capped by two fairly large mining sites that we'll talk about on either end. Um, again, you know, above 12,000 feet in the alpine zone. I thought I'd throw in a little bit of Latin for you just to make you think. Um, this is um, Aquilegia. Did I say it right? <laughs> um, which I began doing a little more um, research when I was putting together this slideshow. And actually, in the Latin, that uh, refers back to eagles and eagles' talons. and if you look at the columbine and look at these, this part of the flower that sticks out that's almost a talon-like claw, and so that's sort of where that Latin name came from. This is a, an alpine flower, al alpine zone flower, and you might find it creeping into other life zones as well. And um, we call those areas where you begin creeping and crossing over life zones. We call those ecotones, and those are some interesting areas to study as well. Uh, just another part of our um, upper watershed, still looking down, town of Telluride is right on, uh, around the corner. Anybody ever driven over Black Bear Pass? Been crazy enough? Okay, I've hiked, this was a hiking day. <laughs> I wasn't in a vehicle, but um, that's where this is. Um, this is one of our alpine zone indicator species. This is the I threw in some Latin again, um, just because it will be a university level course if you take the whole thing. Um, this is the pica. And um, one of the reasons that this is a, and you can see this wasn't my photo. I mean, I wish it was. Um, but I had, we gave a little credit there. Um, this is an indicator species because the pica are becoming um, a, a species that we're looking at as far as being endangered. And uh, anybody have a guess as to why? Climate You're not allowed to answer. <laughs> <laughs> climate, change. climate change. Thanks. Yeah. Um, the pica have a very delicate physiology within their body and they can only operate when it is a certain temperature. If it begins to get too warm, um, they don't survive. And I put at least two pica sites on there if you want to know more about these very, very cute creatures. <laughs> um, this was also uh, an area of study for one of our Bridal Veil students. Um, he did a whole research project on this to the point of putting out a, a camera at night and trying to capture them um, scurrying around in the dark, which he did. Um, he, caught, he caught a few of them. He also caught a few marmots scurrying around as well. So this is an alpine zone, definitely an alpine zone creature. Uh, you won't find it much lower. Uh, squeak? They do. They have a high pitched squeak, a little more higher pitched than a marmot. marmot. Yeah. Yeah. So now we're moving down. This is actually Bridal Veil <laughs> Creek. Um, probably to most the, the real true beginning of the headwaters of the San Miguel. 
Uh, this is just above Bridal Veil Basin. And um, we had some students out there a um, couple summers ago. This is our Bridal Veil Living Classroom again. We make them go rain or shine. Um, but it's a pretty amazing classroom. Um, I don't know, cooler for almost anybody to be there than even here. <laughs> um, <laughs> not that you don't want to be here, but. And uh, we even stick them in the water and uh, make them study the whole, the whole shebang up there. Um, and uh, we try and hit on a lot of the topics on the watershed tour. We never get as intensive as we can with this course. Um, this course ends with a full scientific, <coughs> scientific research paper, um, scientific research projects. Um, we're going to move over to another drainage, um, another valley that runs uh, almost parallel to the Telluride Valley, the Ophir Valley. Um, this is Swamp Canyon, which is one of the headwaters of the Howard's Fork, which is a San Miguel tributary as well. Uh, it's a um, river that's being heavily studied right now because of um, the quality of the water. It's so low. Uh, no fish live in this tributary as of right now. Um, does everybody know where Ophir is? One Valley over, everybody been there? Been up Swamp Canyon? Yeah, it, again, these are all very accessible places to hike uh, there in a lot of the hiking guides. Uh, the Telluride Hiking Guide is getting redone. I think the new edition will be out this summer, which would be great. Um, this is Waterfall Canyon. It's also, it's a, tri it's a tributary. It feeds the Howard's Fork as well. It also is um, a backup source of water for the town of Ophir. Um, so, and you can see, you know, these places, these areas, these basins hold a tremendous amount of snow, um, which is a big part of feeding our watershed. And so events like yesterday with the great winds um, can uh, worry a community like ours because that layer of dust settling on the snow, which is also a study that's being done and something that we'll be looking at in our class. I don't think I put a link to that, but I can give you one if you want one. Um, that dust on snow is heavily being studied in our watershed as well, um, just by virtue of the dust causing um, the snow melt to increase at an exponential rate. So here is our little bit of controversy. This is Hope Lake. It's also a headwaters of the San Miguel River. Um, some say, well, it's a bigger lake than Blue Lake um, as far as surface area, um, but it's not as deep. Um, and cubic feet, I'm not, exact, you know, I'm not exactly sure. I'm pretty sure that Blue Lake has more water. Um, the other little bit of controversy is that uh, we like to say that the San Miguel River is the only, one of only two undammed rivers in the state of Colorado. Anybody know what the other one is? The Yampa. The Yampa, yeah. Um, Hope Lake does have a dam on it, and, and it feeds down to Trout Lake, and that has a dam on it as well. So, but, and this is definitely, the, all of this water feeds into the San Miguel River. Um, We've just moved into, with this photograph, a subalpine zone. Anybody? So we talked about what was missing, and now you can see what's present. As we have our um, aspen, our um, Engelmann spruce and Doug fir <coughs> forest beginning here. Um, and then you can see evidence of the alpine zone there behind it with uh, um, Pilot's Knob and Golden Horn. So uh, this is all part of our upper watershed. Um, lots to study. Um, I've just introduced a little with species, you know, trees, flowers. Um, it could go on and on. I like to throw in being, uh, like I said, I have a twofold background in art and just folding in to Dan's presentation. Um, this is a piece of subalpine art from one of our students um, that was created a couple summer, uh, last summer. And, um, Art and all of this, I think, feed so well together. I mean, it, it just, I almost feel like you can't have one without the other, or at least be thinking about it. Whatever type of art you do, whether it's a piece like this, or something you write, or just something, maybe a song you write if you're that talented. Um, and we've got a lot of mining history. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because, like I said, it flanks both ends of our watershed and fills the middle. 
the mining history does. Um, and this is all up above our watershed. I mean, above our head, you know, in the headwaters area. And um, after that Bridal Veil Creek, this is what our uh, Bridal Veil Creek does. It rushes right over Bridal Veil um, Falls. And it heads right down there to the Ida Rattle Mine, um, which sits sort of also at our headwaters. You can see the settling ponds there. Um, I'm going to grab my notes here because I want to be accurate about this. Um, I've learned things over and over again every time I do a tour, or put together a tour. So um, a lot of people, and me uh, as well, for many years thought that Idorado, this Idorado site was a super fun site. It is not. Um, and I, I called it a super fun site for a long time. So I'm going to get this right. It was identified through the Superfund legacy, but um, the Colorado De Department of Public Health and Environment, um, which is what Camille Price works with, um, was the lead agency on cleaning this up, working with Idorado. And a big piece of this is that Idorado is still a viable mining company. They still have money. And um, so this, you know, they are a part of the process of cleaning this up. And on a watershed tour, we would be meeting with Camille Price and Joe Smart, Camille from the state and Joe with Idorado. And they have a tremendous amount of information that they give us about this whole area and the cleanup. This is just above the town of Tyre, just to the east here. And um, they're basically one of the main indicators that they're, that they're looking at is the levels of zinc in the fish um, just below this mill site. So that's our headwaters. We're looking back. We're looking back at Bridalville. We're looking back at the Blue Lake area. You know, over to the south is Ophir, and then to the south a little bit more is um, the um, Hope Lake, Trout Lake area that all feeds into the San Miguel River. So we're going to leave, and we're going to jump. Um, and this was really tricky. I barely have any slides of the confluence of the Colorado, I mean of the San Miguel and the Little Dolores Rivers without kids in them. Because uh, this is such a favorite place for kids to be in the water, as you can see. Um, what are the differences? I mean, we just, we took a huge leap. We flew 80 miles. Anybody call out any differences that you see? This is the same river. This is the San Miguel over here, just to put you in perspective. And this is the Little Dolores coming in and the Dolores behind us. What do you see? Silt, muddy, murky, anything? Save them. What's that? Different life zone. A different life zone. Exactly. A really different life zone. <laughs> um, yes. And in just a, like I said, a very short 80 miles, uh, which is not a lot, a very far to travel, you know, especially on a water, on a watershed. Anybody know where the Dolores goes? Into the Colorado. Yeah, into the Colorado. Thank you. I can always count on Jenny. So um, we've got some high de desert geology here, um, you know, horizontal sandstone. We're in the Colorado Plateau area here. Again, um, this is the San Miguel coming in um, to the Little Dolores. Um, the sedimentary strata, um, like I said, there's very few, th uh, there's a couple pictures that I had that I got like off Google because <laughs> all of my pictures had kids in them. Um, as you can see, uh, it, it, the, the water is just so inviting down there, especially on a sunny day. Um, and uh, the kids love it. This is the other reason why it's so much better to be there than sitting right here. Um, and uh, and it's, it's amazing. There's Don't a make apologies. They're good for scale. OK, yeah. OK. And they're probably ours. <laughs> they, they, some of them might be yours, <laughs> yes, if you have children. There's a great clay deposit um, along the edge there. <laughs> where the confluence occurs, um, clay, 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 clay like you, the natives would use to make um, pottery. Um, so it's a pretty cool spot. Um, decided to throw out a little Latin again. Um, I called it a flower. I, it's a flowering plant, um, the crimson hedgehog cactus. I learned a little bit more about this um, as I was doing that. but. <laughs>
whole issue of sediment that we begin to get. And um, there certainly are times when the San Miguel can come in very, very muddy. If we have a huge rainstorm or, um, you know, or, and a huge amount of mud and runoff running into our river. But um, the Little Dolores is dammed, and it seems like that, that occurrence of, um, you know, release and, and just kind of not a natural ebb and flow of that river um, cause it to be quite a bit more muddy. Here's an indicator species out there, a little bit different from our friend the pika. Um, this is the Gunnison sage grouse, um, probably soon to be on the endangered species list. I don't know if you've been keeping track of that. Um, there are some, I did put links to that because this is an amazing bird. Um, and if you want to know more about the Gunnison sage grouse, um, I put a few links there. It, it's the coolest bird ever um, with their mating dance. And, um, some were working hard to n not get it on the endangered species. I mean, we'd rather it not be on the endangered species list, right? We'd rather it be healthy, a healthy species that has plenty of room to live and, and to thrive. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be the case right now. I thought this was a really cool picture. I did, there are no children in this picture. Um, for those of you who have ever, ha who's ever been out to this site, Yerevan, or, you know, kind of interesting, there's still a sign there for your van, although there's, uh, and I'm not going to show you a picture of what it looks like right now. If you haven't been out there, you've got to go on the tour because uh, it doesn't look like this anymore. Uh, uh, uranium mining community. Um, this is where Madame Curie did a lot of her work. This is where the um, vanadium uranium it was mined, and uh, the uranium for the um, bombs that were dropped on. Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, this is where the uranium came from, right here in our county along our lovely San Miguel River, right there at the bottom. This is the hanging flume, another piece of mining history, super cool. Um, when you go on the tour, we visit uh, the museum in Natarita. There's an amazing video that's been made about this, and there's really amazing experts um, that know all about this feat of it's, it's an engineering feat um, in the mining world. And um, again, it's right here. There's really nothing else like it anywhere. Um, there's a few hanging flumes. There's one very short section that's sort of similar in California, but doesn't even begin to compare. And I do have a site. I do have links for that. I think they're reconstructing. They're reconstructing a piece. Okay. They're, they're reconstructing about a mile. I don't even think it's a mile. Uh, not even a mile. No. And, they're, and they're trying to use the original tools. Um, and again, there, I did put a link for the hanging flume on the sheet. I just thought this was incredible. Um, probably shouldn't have thrown it in. But mm. these are the ponds, the holding ponds, when Yerevan was Yerevan. Um, and this is the uranium uh, stuff. This is the San Miguel River right here. So that's kind of where that was. Um, this, on the other hand, I've heard both in the last like five years. I delved deeply. This is a super fun site. It is a super fun site. Um, it was identified through the super fun legacy. Um, but again, the lead agency on cleaning it up was the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. But um, this. If you get a, and there is websites. I did put websites about both the Idorado and the Yerevan sites back there if you want to look it up and kind of look at the difference. And this, this was a super fun site. No longer looks like this. You have to go on the tour to see what it looks like now. Um, just some wildlife out there. Um, I tried to find um, the Latin name for a crawfish or a crayfish cr cray or a crawdad. Um, there are potentially six in our area, and um, I couldn't quite pin this one down. So um, that's something that I'll have to keep working on. Uh, some uh, high desert art, just to throw our art pieces in again. This was a collaboration by the Norwood sixth grade when we visited the confluence. Sixth graders working together, that's quite the statement right there. Um, these were the sixth graders. <laughs> uh, I don't remember at what point, before or after. Uh, it's a good view of uh, the muddy muddiness of the Dolores compared to the San Miguel at this point in time, which was spring. And um, that's it. 
Um, we've got a fairly unique watershed, um, something that's uh, well worthy of being preserved. I did include some information on just general um, wild and scenic designation. I'm not even going to get into that, although the course will. Um, it's kind of a complicated process. Uh, if you want to know more, I put a couple links about that. Um, and um, also some links on just preservation through Sheet Mountain Alliance. Um, and um, then also the Chay Wright Institute website. That's it. Will you say something about June 6th? Oh, sure, sure. Um, actually, the Tyrite Institute and um, the Watershed Education Program is sponsoring a hanging flume lecture here at the library on June 6th. And we're having one of the experts, say an archaeologist sort of slash geologist, come in and um, do a whole presentation on the hanging flume. Um, and then um, we're hoping to link it potentially to a field trip uh, to the hanging flume as well. So uh, June 6th here at the library. Thank you. Oh, and that was perfect. Now you get it. Oh, I get this. That's right. Oh, I didn't go over the answers. <laughs> Sorry, we'll do it later. I bet you got it all right. I did. I was test, 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 test. <laughs> okay. So you ready for another another round with me? Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to sort of flip the paradigm uh, a little bit because um, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, knowledge in this room about the watershed, and the the task, the goal tonight, is to actually tap into that knowledge and create a community-based map. And so I'm going to run through some slides and some of the evolution of some of the work I've done with digital mapping and interactive systems and then we're going to move to the other side of the room and log in to these little computers over here and hopefully some of you have access to some images that we could actually populate a map that we've created a framework for so that's that's sort of the trajectory of the next you know 45 minutes and um, I won't ask you if you have images with you right now but I, I think you could probably access them online if you didn't have them in your pocket right so um, Okay, <coughs> and kind of going back to this uh, idea of sort of integrating um, our thinking, Laura and my, and my thinking around um, watershed just fits right into this whole building common ground. And um, I thought that the, some of the text, I'm just lifting it off of the website, but uh, building common ground, discussions of community civility and compassion providing a framework for Wilkinson Public Library to build abundant community and lead local residents, government officials, and nonprofit organizations towards creating a new vision for a sustainable local economy in Telluride. So this was the language out of the grant application. Um, <coughs> now, some leading questions. Um, how do we wish to represent ourselves in the 21st century? Um, does the visual culture and public face of the Telluride region express the tenets of nurture capital? Uh, this was the lecture that we got a couple of weeks ago around the idea of slow money. And what pictures of place come to mind when you think about the following? Carrying capacity, care of the commons, sense of place, nonviolence, and are the images that we that come to mind to sort of pop into your head uh, resonant with those kinds of ideas, or are the images that pop come to mind you know at, at some kind of uh, at odds with those with those notions? It's pretty complicated because if I reflect on those four themes, uh, I can think of the kind of the inverse of each of those as examples. You know, in terms of the history of Telluride. <clears throat> so, kind of going back, and I, I don't think most of you have seen these, these images, but there's some pretty, I, I couldn't resist throwing in some of the, the history of mapping and of imaging of place. Um, but oftentimes, the maps in particular uh, emphasize the particular kinds of um, 
economies and uh, uh, biases and priorities that are occurring in a particular landscape. And if we go back to 1891, obviously mining is the primary enterprise in the upper reaches of the, of the San Miguel. And so you've got gold shares down here being sold. Uh, on the left, you're seeing um, the confluence uh, with Leopard Creek. So this is Placerville right down here in the bridge across Leopard Creek. And these were really produced to um, entice people to invest in, in this particular case, in placer mines. And some of my family was probably involved in some shady schemes. I just, <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, not, it was a couple of years ago, my, found out that my grandfather had a mine up Deep Creek uh, called the Mountain Flower. And, and I said, well, I'll just Google that. And I found it, you know, I found the, the shares for the Mountain Flower mine and how much it was trading for. And there was some speculation because there was an interpretation of this site and it said, yeah, this was probably not uh, uh, a legitimate site, <laughs> you know, I guess that's the long and short of it. So my grandfather was involved in probably some kind of shady dealings up Deep Creek, probably in, uh, probably in the 20s. Um, here's another early map, of kind of a little further up the canyon, obviously Telluride, this is a detail of this map on the left, uh, this emphasizing uh, mineral resources and, and you're seeing all of the mines that are being uh, indicated on this particular map. Um, my other grandfather on my mother's side was a Swedish immigrant and he had stores at the Smuggler and, and the Liberty Bell and they lived on Oak Street and he used to ski down at the end of every day. Um. Dan, in the, the previous one to this one, did you look at how much water is in the Sandy Hill? Yeah. Hmm. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> And, but, uh, well, I think, I think there is this, this kind of almost fantasy landscape a little bit it, with the idea of trying to sell shares to somebody who's never seen the property, you know. It is. I wonder if the guy that drew it ever came to the camp. <laughs> Early topo map, 1898, but this is incredibly uh, detailed and accurate, uh, nevertheless, over 100 years old. Mm. And then, I, I mean, I'm kind of fast forwarding here, but this, uh, people around here are obviously aware of the narrow gauge railway, and um, there were, uh, there's this famous loop, the narrow gauge circle, which connects up. People would leave, um, actually, it was a very famous tour where you'd go from all the way from Denver and follow that. Uh, blue, and then come around into the, this is our region right in here, obviously. But as um, tourism came into, uh, into the picture as a kind of an economic force, you know, the, for a long time the, the railroads were really figuring heavily into that, and they still do to a certain extent, of course, between Durango and Silverton and down to Chama and so on. But my, my mother tell, used to tell stories of riding. She went to high school in Durango from, from Telluride, and she would ride the Galloping Goose from Telluride to Durango just by herself. You know, this is in the 30s. And, and so she really had very fond memories of the Galloping <coughs> Goose, which closed down around 1951. And then fast forward to last year. This is a hiking and biking trails in the Telluride region. So again, different emphases in terms of these maps. They tell a real uh, poignant picture about the transformation of the economy and our understanding of place through the history of maps. Now, you know, as, as we enter the age of the internet, there's other kinds of um, the availability of mapping instruments has really exploded. And uh, I showed this last time, last spring, when I was talking about uh, community-based maps. Um, this, is, this shows uh, so-called food deserts, and if we zoom in on the local region, um, the pink area is showing uh, San Juan County, number of people, number of people with low access, pretty much the whole, <laughs> the whole population of the county. What they mean by low access is here, how close are you to a supermarket? 
Uh, well, that's kind of strange. I mean, if you have, does that mean that somebody that has a garden in, in the backyard and a bunch of chickens, they obviously don't, they're not in a food desert in the least. So we have these conceptions about what constitutes uh, abundance and what kinds of relationship we should have to the local landscape. If we can drive to a supermarket within 10 miles, this is a good thing, you know. But if we, if you raise chickens and have a garden, you're kind of off the, off the census tables in terms of how the federal government is tracking these ideas. So it's a curious kind of reversal of what we're talking about here, which is about a food shed and procuring your, your foods within a 50 mile radi radius and so on. Um, this is a little hard to see. This is just a, a hike taken with students down the Keystone Gorge. You can see that the, the blue uh, pins are just points where we took photographs and took an elevation uh, using handheld GPS and, and Android phones and stuff. And then we took that information and uploaded it to a Google map and created this map. This shows the, the change in elevation, uh, obviously exaggerated in this graph. But that got us thinking about how we could use these same instruments for um, gathering information about the valley floor. And so we did a, an ISP last year, a year ago in the fall, with David Lavender's class, where the students were the uh, data collectors, the citizen scientists. And you can recognize society turn here. This is uh, out of about 13 or 14 kids. There were about four or five that really got into this. And, and among those, they had their own Androids with GPS-enabled uh, kind of location uh, capability. And so they went out and picked um, a, a particular target. There were three that uh, David Lavender's group were looking for. They were looking for historic structures, like at San Miguel. They were looking for noxious weeds and for prairie dog holes. So this, this represents prairie dog holes and badger holes uh, in that particular sector. And then uh, Lance, so we put that on a map, and then Lance McDonald used that in the presentation about the trend lines for, for prairie dog uh, populations. So uh, it raises a whole interesting kind of idea about uh, tapping into the local community, the students, the citizen scientists that we have living in the region, and using them to monitor uh, changes in the landscape and bring rich data to the community in ways that we could never afford if we were hiring scientists to do this. Uh, this guy's ninth grader. Um, we're talking with some folks in Maine right now through the Telluride Institute connection. Uh, this is just kind of more of a slide about uh, an awareness of a very interesting program called Vital Signs. And they've established a program with um, uh, the University of Southern Maine and some other educational institutions to um, provide a whole set of online tools for guiding research into landscapes and habitat uh, in Maine. So this is very specific to Maine, but we've initiated the conversation and, and it's all open source. It's all coded in Drupal, which is a open source protocol for doing interactive sites. And uh, they would like to partner with us and expand into the Colorado area. And so it's very detailed. I'm not going to spend really any time to talking about it, but you get right down to the level of these PDFs that you can download and, uh, you know, dissolved oxygen, salinity, and so on. So, and they have different curricula that's pitched at different levels from elementary school all the way up to, again, citizen scientists. And so there's a kind of an interactive flow chart where you can select your habitat, select your, your level of research expertise, select the instruments that you would like to use in relationship to a particular habitat or um, zone. And then that is all stored on a server and you can return to it again and again and add to that information or send it to another group or whatnot. So it's a great model. And Laura has such a tremendous curriculum already in place with the Watershed Education Program. And I think we could sort of combine some of the capacity of the online materials, you know, even though she doesn't like this classroom, you know. I mean, I think that kind of toggling back and forth between these kinds of discussions with place-based learning and experiential education can be very powerful. <coughs> 
So more on this later. Oh, also Gulf of Maine Research Institute is the other partner. Um, <coughs> so in terms of interactive systems, some of you have seen this, these slides before, I think this little section. Uh, but uh, my design partner, Gene Cooper, and I have done a number of these interactive maps for different museums around the West. This was, um, well, this was at the Grand Canyon for a while. It's currently at the Arizona Science Center in the physical science uh, wing. And um, it's a little hard to see what you're looking at. I'll, you'll see it in another slide. But uh, this is a trackball right here. So you're coming up to this thing that looks kind of like a game console. And there is a physical relief map that is receiving a video projection. And so you can come up and move this trackball and select different hyperlinks within this map. And then wherever you select, that gives uh, enhanced information, contextual information up on the slide. And so you can select a whole variety of maps to project onto this surface. Another kind of cool thing about it is that it's plugged into the internet so we can pull in RSS feeds. So wherever you're putting your your cursor on this particular physical relief map, it will deliver the real-time temperature. You know, so uh, you know, down in the canyon versus the rim could be 50, 60 degrees uh, difference. This is another uh, project we did for the Exploratorium in San Francisco, uh, which is a big science, art, and perception museum. So it's a real interdisciplinary place, been going since the middle 60s. Uh, how many have been to the Exploratorium? I, you know, you, there's some San Francisco types in here. Mm -hmm. um, so th again, this is a relief model. Um, it's produced uh, by I downloaded satellite data, which is freely available on the web. And then uh, I have a big um, router in my studio, and I cut the model uh, in reverse. And then we cast fiberglass into that reverse mold and then sandblasted the fiberglass. So that's the base model. So all the color information is all video projection, uh, HD video projection from a really nice projector about 25 feet up uh, to create this 8 foot by 8 foot image. And then you interact with it through a touch screen in this case rather than a trackball. And um, you have additional kind of contextual information about uh, the processes of the bay. Let me see if I can get to the there. So at this point, this is the, the, the little screen that you interact with. And you, the museum personnel wanted us to use the term floaty rather than buoy. I don't know why. But anyway, you, you launch a, a floaty into the bay. And then that little floaty will start to respond to actual tidal data. And so we, one of the collaborators on the project was a Stanford um, fluid dynamics expert who focuses on the San Francisco Bay and other large-scale <coughs> bodies of water, coastal bodies of water. Um, so he, he had done uh, a longitudinal study about fluid flow and gave us that data. And then we pretty much visualized it. And so what you're seeing here is the floaty, the, the, the yellow circle is leaving a little tail, and you're able to see its sort of track. So if you drop a buoy, a floaty, right at the Golden Gate Bridge, with the tidal flow, it gets, it gets shoved out right to the continental shelf. And then the tidal flow reverses. It comes zooming through that Venturi tube. And sometimes it goes all the way up to the Sacramento Delta, kind of hangs out there for a little while. And then it might go all the way down to the mud flats around San Jose. And then it sort of moves again. And then it goes up to the bay and then out to the continental shelf. And over a 14-day cycle, you're really understanding the dynamics of the bay through this interactive digital system. It's at a scale that would be difficult to understand at the level of the ground. but doesn't it make you want to go out there and then see those actual processes of the water moving under the Golden Gate, for example? Uh, another one we did for the city of Tempe was more of a historical display. It has a whole bunch of different layers uh, which focus on um, the demographics of Tempe, Arizona, and heat island effect, and uh, historical changes over time. 
And this is a great big touch panel, actually. Uh, this is sort of a detail, kind of a mock-up for our presentation. You don't, you don't really, this doesn't really work quite this way, but. <laughs> so you can, you can select, where's my mouse? These are the four themes that the museum came up with. Surviving the desert, living together, college town, building our community. So if you click on one of these menus, menu items, then you'd get a sub-menu of all these different kinds of um, aspects of the community. And then if you clicked on historic properties, you, the whole map would be populated with these red targets. And if you selected a red target, you'd get a pop-up showing a historical photo. <coughs> now, quick, a little quick note on the GIS that the San Miguel County has developed, which is a geographic information system. And that's something that got me very excited uh, a number of years ago now, I think around 2007, um, the county made the decision to put the whole uh, geographic information system online to make it accessible to the general public through a website. And um, I, in fact, I came to a presentation at the, right here about 2007 uh, in the, when we had the computer room upstairs. And uh, Heather, Heather, what's Heather's last name? Widmer? She's, uh, she's, uh, she's in the planning office and is the GIS specialist for the county. Heather Widmer, W-I-D-M-E-R. Anyway, she sits in the little room making maps all day long for us. And, and she doesn't get out much, but she makes great maps. And um, this particular set of protocols has really exploded and become much more accessible through um, our own sort of personal browsers and so on. Um, originally, we have... Uh, GIS mapping, uh, which includes the geographic and uh, geometric kinds of features of a place, but then you have multiple layers that you can select and see correlations between. And this is one of the powers, is that you have both this kind of ability to drill through multiple layers, and you have a kind of parametric function of its visual representation and its relationship to a database. So if you, uh, if you get into GIS, it's a very powerful tool for um, exploring place um, in a very systematic way or archiving features of place in a very systematic way. If it has a downside, it's, be, it's, it's, it's the fact that it's very top down in terms of its conception. Um, it, it's a very sophisticated protocol that generally will feature all of the kind of physical features of place, certainly its demographics, tax, uh, uh, tax maps and topographic maps and sewer lines, all the kinds of practical things that go into defining a place um, in, a f in an analytical way. But generally what it's not carrying is the cultural features of place generally speaking. So I made a proposal to the county several years ago to create a cultural layer for the county that would include all the stuff that gets left off of the, the map. And that's something that we're sort of still working on. And I've got a couple of different instances of that. But simultaneous with that process, we had this explosion in online mapping technologies and uh, interactive systems that we have control of without going over to the county and worrying about whether we could get access to the county server or not. So we have at our fingertips. I mean, we all have maps in our pocket now, navigation tools. So in this sort of new generation of GIS maps, a lot of the um, maps that are available online uh, are taking the sophisticated mapping instruments developed first as sort of standalone products as uh, these massive GIS systems and porting them over to web accessible uh, browser-based technologies. Now they're not as sophisticated, they're not as powerful, but they are great for the kinds of things we do for watershed education. So here is a uh, here's a, an online instrument. ESRI is the big company that's one of the major players in GIS technology. And so they've been 
understanding that, uh, you know, they see the handwriting on the wall, that it's all about all these multiple sort of systems on a convergent path, and they want to be at the forefront of handheld technology, of server-based technology, of platforms in the home, and allow these different kinds of representations to be able to be traded and moved around very efficiently. So, for example, I spent a lot of time learning GIS, you know, the, the straight GIS, and um, it's quite complicated to get it into a um, web-based uh, representation. Uh, so they are providing APIs and other, other kinds of tools that allow you to move that GIS information into web-based uh, systems. So here's a little watershed map, San Miguel County, and these little pins are hyperlinks to cultural practices within, within the watershed. And this is just a little proof of concept. It's not meant to be comprehensive. There's just a, a handful of pins. Um, but uh, where do these go? So if we go to out to Norwood, there is a, uh, you know, a pin uh, right at Cloudacre, you know where Art Good Times lives, right outside of Norwood, right? Um, and so that's zooming into that same map. Okay, let me just go back so you can see where there's that pin right there. And I don't know if I, I, I don't have, this is a PowerPoint, so that's not a hot link, but um, if you were to click on that poem, this is what would come up, uh, which is the view out his back door towards the lone cone. So the idea here is it, what I sort of got excited about reading Art's poems. I said, this is poetry with geocoordinates. You know, this is the idea of something that's very much about place, but it's a poetic cultural practice. And so you have this kind of analytic <laughs> aspect of, of uh, the geometry of space combined with the meaning and experiential aspects of someone who has been here over 30 years living in that place and has a certain love for that landscape and that particular view. This is only a fraction of this great poem called The Right Stuff. There's the whole poem. We, we won't read it because we've got lots to do tonight, but do go find this poem. Um, now there's another um, recent set of protocols that I got excited about which are uh, incident mapping software. And this is around the, uh, particularly around the Middle East and in, uh, Africa. Uh, there's been a lot of work in developing uh, toolkits for allowing people at the level of the street to map current events and their own circumstances, even hour by hour if they choose to do that. So there's a, uh, this is a very interesting website, ushahidi.com, and this is a group of um, guys in Africa who have developed this software, and it, it allows you to uh, not only locate uh, an event, but also to tie into RSS feeds, um, real simple syndication feeds, uh, of news broadcasts that are constantly being sort of sent over the wire. So you don't have to go to your website, your webmaster, and say, oh, can you attach this news broadcast to my website because, it, you know, it's <coughs> happening, you know. Okay, I'll get to it, you know, in a couple of days. No, this is, this is real-time population of your website through RSS feeds. Just like the weather that I was showing you with the Grand Canyon using an RSS feed, this is live news that's being tied to a map. And so it's a very powerful way of sharing uh, hot spots, uh, yeah. you know, internationally. Yeah. So are you saying that, um, like, I could click on um, Beijing and I could, uh, I could just at the same time get radio Beijing, Beijing's broadcast? You, if you set it up that way, yeah. Because <laughs> if you if you just go, uh, and I'm not sure about China because there's <laughs> certain kinds of firewalls and so on. But in theory, if you had clear access to news broadcasts coming from particular locales. The way you do it, just go to, just go to, use your browser, do a Google search for RSS feeds Beijing, let's say, and it's going to give you all of the broadcasts, and there's a little piece of snippet of code that, and it's not hard to do. You take that snippet of code and you drop it into this site, and it's going to um, populate your map with these live feeds. It's really cool. 
So here is um, what you're seeing in this particular map. I say, well, let's use this for cultural practices instead of just you know, uh, you know, violent events in the Middle East or whatever. Well, this is a different violence. This is the the tsunami at Fukushima, Fukushima, and um, the reason I put a dot there was that Ellen Metric, who is our poet laureate right now, uh, did a poem about imagining the people, uh, the people's experience in uh, Fukushima, and uh, trying to and trying to get her head around what it me must be like. I mean, so this is a um, this is a, a wiki. This is a co-created website that is linked to the map. So there's two different softwares being used here. But on the wiki, which is a free uh, way of creating a co-created website, I've placed Ellen Metric's poem about Fukushima. And so when you click on that, on the red link here, it takes you to a wiki and you read the poem. But it's a very immediate, uh, I think pretty satisfying way of um, bringing, let's say, art or cultural practices right into um, the events of the day. This is, um, so a lot of this, uh, yeah, I'm throwing around a lot of terms, but GIS is Geographic Information System, but there's a whole literature that is participatory GIS or PGIS, which is the idea of people making their own maps, essentially, and, or you're at least drawing data from the level of the street rather than only giving top-down information. So this was, this was actually several years ago at this point, but this was a group in Leeds, uh, England, that had developed a map um, about mapping perceptions of fear or fear of place. And so the, it's a very simple kind of um, little protocol where they, they give you a digital spray can that sprays purple. So you're going to go tag, like graffiti, you're going to go tag a place. And if you live in this little village and you're worried about the fact that I don't want to walk after dark to the market, you would take your digital spray can and spray that street. And some place else, well, I have to wait too long for the bus and I, I get scared. Spray that place. So all these individuals in this little town, this little metropolis of Bradford, uh, participated in this process and then they did these overlays of all of these spray can marks to create density maps. So where there was the most overlap between the purple, that would be the area where there need to be extra special attention paid. But the interesting thing was we see a lot of crime mapping, but it's always after the fact and it's usually driven by sort of top-down assumptions about populations. It's not driven from the actual, again, level of the street or what the citizen is experiencing. And there's this other idea of um, even taking the map making into a, a physical process. Uh, this is a process that happened to be in the Philippines. The third world is really um, very interested, in general, is very interested in these processes where um, cartographers with these um, uh, kind of interests in, in indigenous land ownership and legacy rights to, to land will move into different areas. This is happening in Canada and Latin America, Southeast Asia, Africa, the Native American reservations, and doing mapping exercise with, ac exercises with the local population. And um, I'll just go to the next slide. It's a little easier to see. So this is the um, satellite perspective on land use on the left. This is the modified map uh, done with the assistance of local people giving oral histories and other kinds of information to refine that map. So, uh, and as it turns out, it's a lot more accurate and a lot more useful. Thanks for coming, you guys. We're going to put in the library, uh, once we kind of figure out exactly how we want to configure it and where it needs to go and all that kind of stuff. Um, and this is something like the one that I did for the Grand Canyon with Gene Cooper. Uh, so this was the original CAD design. And then this is what we previewed in uh, the AHA school last, uh, last August. Citizen scientists, kids love this. and. Um, 
So you're seeing, again, the video projection on a relief map. It's a little hard to read there. And they're using the trackball to select different targets in this map and then call up uh, contextual information. In this case, they have a geology map. And they are selecting different strata up and down the watershed and then getting um, chemical information, the scientific name, everything in these uh, color-coded uh, diagrams in the upper screen. We've, but we also got beautiful pictures and panoramas and other things that are also loaded into the system. So the point is that it's not what we load into the system, but what you guys could potentially load into the system. And so again, it's a bottom-up participatory <laughs> practice that we're interested in. So that gets us, brings us right to the present. And so Gene and I have been um, working on sort of the next iteration of this stuff. There's another package that some of you may know. Uh, Google bought them out a couple of years ago uh, called Panoramio. And it's an online uh, photographic archive, if you will. Uh, but the thing that's cool about it, and they were kind of one of the first out of the gate to do this, so they're using a online digital map, and then you upload your photographs to your own personal website, um, and then you just drag over and locate it uh, where you took the photograph, and then the photograph sticks to that particular place. Or if you have your camera, uh, you know, GPS enabled, then you can do this automatically where the, the camera has metadata, I mean the photograph has metadata that uh, locates the lat long and it will just sort of snap it to the particular location. So in this case, um, I made this little site a couple of days ago and, and then I put out an invitation to build a group site that would be focused on the San Miguel watershed. And I went out online and I found some photographs that were already in the watershed. And then I sent pretty much auto-generated emails to about 15 people and photographers who have done work in the region. And this one guy bit, and I don't even know where he lives, but he does beautiful work. And he's really focused on the upper basin and really high level ridge, you know, subalpine zone. And so this is one of his photographs. I don't really know his name. It's, it's A. Jim C. Davis. Does anybody know a Davis photographer? He's not here, is he? No. Probably Rudy Davis. Maybe. Okay. Maybe. That would be in character. Ah. <laughs> OK, so now over, over here, this is the next. After that, we've got this system, which we just are launching today, uh, and uh, because I want you guys, some of you guys to sit down at these computers, this is, a, this is actually a touch screen. And so you can touch, the, touch a dot on here, and it will, if it is, <coughs> there we go. I don't know. I think my fingers are. <laughs> yeah. You do it the opposite way. All right, forget it. <laughs> anyway, what we're, I know you can't see this from there, but what you're seeing is the outline of the watershed. And then all of these pins are um, individual photographs. I'll just use the mouse, and I know it will work. Come on. I'll go this way. Oh, you know what? We unplugged the we unplugged yeah. the internet to get your camera to work. Okay, so I'm not I'm not live here. That's why it's not working. These all these pins. I know you can barely see it. Are just people who have uploaded photographs to this Panoramio site. But we are taking that feed from the Panoramio site and bringing it into a different interface. And so we're tapping into this large community. We don't even know who it is. And so this is kind of what you're seeing here, a different version of the same thing. Um, now what you can do in, in, when you code these sites is limit the frame that you're looking at in terms of that landscape. And you can also create targeted groups. So I, you could say, OK, I'm going to use these 20 people or these 200 photographs or whatever. 
and limit it to the class, Laura's class, and populate the watershed with the photographs and then share it online, that kind of idea. So this is the, really the last slide. Um, but thinking about going back to this idea of currency and what is our kind of common currency now, and you think about water now, whereas maybe it was gold years ago, we also think about information, you know, is a different kind of, um, has a different kind of value. Um, it's a very kind of interesting quote there at the top that makes that analogy between uh, the value of gold versus the value of information. Um, kind of skip down here, by building a shared knowledge, knowledge base that reflects our understanding of place, from the headwaters of the San Miguel to its confluence with the Dolores, the little Dolores, uh, can we find a common currency for problem solving in the region? You know, it, you know, you think about this tremendous conflict that's going on right now over issues of water. Uh, you know, Montrose County wants to open up water so that we can have the uranium mill, and that's, you know, crazy. But on the other hand, uh, no, I, I, but I, we have this shared resource that if we can somehow represent the place effectively and draw in a greater community of input into this shared conception of place, that's kind of thing where that, there's a, there's a kind of a, an expanded knowledge base that everybody has immediate access to so that they're not sort of in their own little pockets, you know. We get in our little pockets up there, people down at the West End get in their little pockets, and we're not seeing the big picture because we don't have the information at our fingertips, you know. But we do, we potentially do. So anyway, that's, that's the thing. Now, uh, okay, the, our little exercise, our little hands-on thing, if you're game, let me get my paperwork. <laughs> and you can take this home, we'll just pass this out.